thanks for uh, inviting us. Uh, thanks to the STC for hosting this uh, prov and providing this venue here. So uh, I'm going to talk about scalable machine learning um, with Apache System ML. Uh, show of hands, how many have heard of System ML before? Uh, it's about <laughs> the other one you don't count. <laughs> it's about 10%, let's say. So it's small number. All right. So. Uh, when I drove up here this afternoon, uh, my team kind of told me, okay, some metrics, how my presentation will be measured for tomorrow is how many people will go to GitHub and, and star system ML. Okay? So I will take you to the URL, either in the course of the presentation, if you get really bored of the presentation, or tonight when you go home, or tomorrow morning, first thing when you go into the office, go to the GitHub system ML and push the star button. Okay? Promise? <laughs> Otherwise, cut him off the pizza, you know. <laughs> so, honestly, um, what is System ML? So, in a nutshell, System ML, uh, it gives you a language. This language is not a programming language. It's a language for the data scientist to implement machine learning algorithms, okay? Machine learning algori algorithms that you can run on, on a small iris data set, or you run it on 10, mil 10 billion rows and, and 10,000 columns, okay? And System ML, we built a compiler, okay, with a cost-based optimizer that looks at whatever machine learning algorithm you have implemented, okay. We look at the data characteristics that you want to run it over, okay, as well as if you give us a single node or a cluster, uh, like a Spark cluster to run on, we take those three factors in and generate an optimal execution plan, okay, that runs uh, the machine learning algorithm for you. That's it, okay. We have different execution modes for System ML. It can run um, embedded uh, as a library. It can run as a standalone uh, Java application in, in a single JVM, in which case, obviously, you will not get a, a scale-out execution plan. Uh, or it runs in the cluster that we call hybrid. Okay? And hybrid means that you know, if you look at your machine learning algorithm, you have a whole bunch of operations in there. Some of them are tiny operations. You don't want to run on the cluster. It's overkill. But the large operations, you want to farm out to, to the cluster. That's what we call hybrid. Okay? We also have a whole bunch of uh, APIs in there. So you can use it from Java. You can use it from Scala. You can use it from Python. And uh, I will take you through those examples. So we are SystemML today. We started with SystemML project uh, a few years ago. Um, last November, officially, it became an Apache incubator project. Okay, so the URL is right there. And um, even before we put it out there, uh, we incorporated it into an uh, uh, IBM big data product called Big Insights. It's, it's part of that. Uh, as part of Big Insights, we have uh, um, se several modules in there, one of them being the data scientist module, and the data scientist module has system ML in it. And of course, it's also an ongoing research. Uh, project at the IBM Almaden Research Center, and we are connected to the products team, we are co connected to the SEC team, uh, we are connected to open source, so we love all of you. <laughs> all right, um, did everyone copy down the URL? It's very simple, systemml.apache.org. I'm going to check on the way out, okay? <laughs> it's going to be a quiz. So if you go to this URL, okay, that's our website. Okay, now I cannot see it here. Uh, it has a brief description on it. There's a couple of very important points there. Uh, I don't know. Um, here's the GitHub. Okay, that's where our, our, our code is. You just go there. Um, so star button is right there. <laughs> okay, just making sure that you guys see it. Um, so go and download the code. Um, we spent, uh, you know, initially System ML was a research project, and you know, research is research. We do a lot of things here. The, we do a really lousy job in documenting it. <laughs> uh, but since it became an open source project, uh, uh, documentation, it's really uh, fantastic. Uh, I really encourage you to go there. A lot of the presentation that I'm, uh, I'm going to show here is actually you know, just on this uh, documentation website here. You see all the different modes, how to run System ML. Um, you have uh, links to the, to the uh, documentation of our language on how to implement machine learning algorithms. And uh, I cannot really see much from this angle. <laughs> um, it's an open source project. Okay, I encourage you to go to 
uh, community. Uh, which one is this, the first one or the second one? I cannot see it. So somewhere there is an, an issues tracker in there, uh, which takes you to, to the Jira server. Go and check it out. There is a lot of work defined in there. Uh, pick some, implement it, uh, commit it back to open source. Okay. So, why should you care? <laughs> There's a lots of reasons uh, why you should care. So, uh, so as I said before, we've been looking, uh, we've been working on system ML for for quite a few years now, and it's not that on day one we said, okay, let's do system ML. <laughs> uh, that's not how things happen. So we talked to a lot of IBM customers, uh, we paid attention to the industry, and we summarized uh, all those kind of use cases uh, on this one slide to some degree. And you know, I hope you can see it's not a, a, a single vertical industry that wants to do big data and provides use cases. It really comes from all kinds of different industries. Okay? And the problem definitions are very different. Okay? But you have to look at a large number of those and then you know, try to, to summarize them and come up with a, a smallish number, which is what we did here, that you want to support. Okay, just to mention a couple of examples, like uh, the first one from the insurance company, they just came to us and said, "We want to try out your platform." Okay, and uh, how how easy is it for a data scientist or a developer to do uh, parallel model building? Okay, so if they just said, "No, here is." In fact, they came with an R script to us, said, "No, here's an R grid linear regression." Okay, do it a uh, uh, hundred thousand times. Okay, how do you parallelize it? And and we did that. Okay, system ML can do that for you. We have constructs built into system ML to do that for you. Another one was an automotive company. Uh, it did not have anything to do with emission control, so don't worry about that. <laughs> uh, but they came to us and said, you know, we have so much data, okay, but we have a problem with uh, uh, customer satisfaction. Okay, so we built a classifier for them. And we started off uh, with a few hundred feature variables at first, and then we realized the more features we added, and eventually we ended up with 22,000 features the better accuracy and better model we were able to create. Okay. Can your system today run 22,000 uh, feature variables, logistic regression on it? <laughs> Download system ML. I showed you the button. <laughs> okay. Another one, uh, air transportation. Uh, you go to you know, San Francisco airport. You can gridify the entire airport into like three by three kind of grids. And you connect to the Wi-Fi system there. You know, so the routers, they can uh, kind of triangulate your location there. Okay, and record it into timestamp, location, and the MAC address. Okay, and then you can actually analyze the data and maybe you know develop an ARIMA model to predict uh, how many uh, MAC addresses will be at this location uh, 12 hours, 24 hours, or six months from now. Okay, depending on what accuracy you will develop. And we had several other use cases here from financial industry. A lot of them were. Uh, about uh, you know bivariate statistics to do correlation analysis. We had uh, from retail banking again about bivariate statistics mostly and other services companies. We were approached by uh, by a railroad company. Okay, and they said we have uh, seven thousand variables. Okay, uh, can you do PCA on it? Okay, or an insurance company came. You know, we, I, we give you 10, 10 billion rows. Okay, can you do a generalized linear model on it? Okay, so the problem spectrum, it's very, very different, okay? Uh, eventually, we summarized it all, okay? And we said, so big data analytics use case, you know, what is it really about? We don't have a textbook definition here, but when people talk about it, they say, well, we want to do large number of model building, okay, in parallel, okay? Those things are embarrassing, parallelizable, but you have to provide the infrastructure for it, okay? Obvious points are a large number of rows. Okay, they have a thousand rows today, and then they deploy it, and the company grows, and whatever. Eventually, they have ten billion rows. Okay, number of features. Okay, especially if you go into text applications, very quickly you go up to you know tens or hundreds of thousands of feature variables. All right, and you need to be able to run sparse data. Large data is sparse data. Okay, your system has to support sparse data. All right. Large number of intermediates, that's very often the case that we encounter. Uh, large, large, number, uh, large number of pairs, so that comes into the picture. If I have large number of feature variables and they want to do bivariate um, you know, correlation analysis, then you have to embarrassingly parallelize you know, all those pairs that you want to do the co correlation analysis very quickly on it. And 
very often we, we said, OK, you know, here's an algorithm. OK, and then they said, well, but you know, it doesn't really exactly do what we want it to do. How do you customize it? So in you know, probably in 80% of all those cases, like a textbook machine learning algorithm, it did not quite cut it. But you had to go in and modify it for that specific use case. All right? So let's get to work. I'm not going to use one of those use cases. I'm going to use a, a really old slide. Okay. How can you tell that it's an old slide? Just checking with the people. Uh, Tiger, Woods. Tiger Woods. Wow, amazing. OK, it goes a few years back. But it still holds, OK? The application still holds. <laughs> Which one? Yes, there's dates too. With really good eyes. <laughs> <laughs> so the example is the following, OK? You, you have Twitter data. You go and download it. You put each tweet in, in a bag of words kind of model. You build a very large matrix up there. On the, on the column level, you have tokens. On the vertical, uh, you have the tweets, OK? You build up this uh, document token kind of matrix. And now you want to find out uh, you know, what are people talking about in social media, OK? Maybe you do a product launch, OK? And you want to capture those tweets and figure out, is it good, is it bad? What do they like? What do they not like? Or whatever. So it turns into what people call a, a matrix factorization problem, where it takes this very large matrix, okay, and break it down into two lower ranked matrices, which is a document topic matrix as well as a topic word kind of matrix. Let's call them W and H. I'm going to refer back to those variables. So stay with me. So and there's a lot of techniques on how to do uh, matrix factorization, and um, uh, but the point is really that the matrix is hopefully extremely large. Okay. <coughs> now, if you go now, okay, and implement uh, a matrix factorization mat uh, algorithm, and in this case here we decided to go with non-negative matrix factorization, specifically the GNMF, the Gaussian non-negative matrix factorization. There's a lot of implementations for it. Okay, uh, the Java implementation is. Uh, not a Spark implementation, it, it's a MapReduce implementation, okay? But it still can be used to, make, to, get, to get the point across. So GNMF, it's an old algorithm introduced by some AT&T folks about 2001 or so, okay? And there's a, a very nice paper about it in the, in the Nature magazine. And the way they describe this algorithm, if you open up the paper, it's really in terms of linear algebra kind of expressions. Okay, yeah. they defined and spent a lot of time defining what they call those two update rules. Right, you you have your, your large V that you started off with. Okay, and then you have some random initialization with W and H, and then it's an iterative algorithm. In the iterations, you update H and W until you you know reach maximum number of iterations, or you have some convergence criteria that you're happy with. Okay, if you implement that one in the low-level programming language against MapReduce, and maybe Scala Spark, uh, instead of 1,500, it's 1,000. It's 1, but it's still not in the same spirit as what the paper was written in, in linear algebra. <coughs> Using SystemML, and that's our implementation of GNMF, in 10 lines of code at this high level, you can express that entire algorithm. OK? Now. This paper came out in 2001. And how many people of you are really data scientists? Right, so there's quite a few numbers in here. <laughs> Don't be shy. <laughs> um, so I so, so actually. Can I ask a question? What, what enables you to compress that much code? Is it that, you know, is it the, those operators, the percent? Yes, the so percent? it's. it's uh, so that's our language, OK? And it has a lot of linear algebra, linear algebra primitives in it. And I will take you through it. So it's a lot of like, uh, so our language is modeled after R language. So it's an R-like syntax. So percent star percent is matrix multiplication. Transpose W, matrix multiple V, cellwise division, okay. so, and so forth, OK? And that's really how the paper is actually written, OK? Now, as a data scientist, you implement that, you run it, you look at the results, you're unhappy. The paper came out in 2001, and pretty much every other year, some other researchers published another paper which improved on that one uh, by, you know, modifying those uh, those update rules, you know, by adding some regularization, by adding some scaling, by adding whatever. Okay. Now, if you implemented your algorithm that way, it's very easy to modify it. Okay. A data scientist should be extremely happy. 
um, if you did it in Java or in Scala at this lower level, you may have to revisit a lot of code. Okay. Get the point? Yes and no. So, uh, like, so suppose like you can o overload the operators. Uh -huh. Suppose we can create a library in Java which does exactly that. Yes. Right? Yes. Sure. But you know, a data scientist. Uh, so. There's a small number of data scientists here. Hopefully, you're on my side. Okay. Would you really drop down to a Java language to implement your machine learning algorithm, or would you really st you know, stay with, uh, let's say, Python or R, as you know, like a specialized so language you, kind you of thing? You say that data scientists like uh, cannot is not capable to, to, to kind of to learn Java. Like I would. Scala, I would, agree I would never say that. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I don't want to say that. But I think they prefer a higher level language. Okay. Right, right. Yeah. Without. Without like. ID without debug tools, without ability to... No, you still want to have those capabilities in there, right? Your IDEs are always wonderful, uh, mm -hmm. no doubt about it. But it, it's, a, it's a different level of abstraction where data scientists think. So plus your, your operators vectorized, right? Yes. So uh, doing it at that level gives you some benefits too in terms of performance that we will talk about as well. Okay. Yes? Why didn't you just use R? R does not scale. Okay. You could use it as a language. Rather than saying you're for the Why don't you use R as a language? It is an R-like syntax, right? <laughs> yeah. I'm sorry, say it again. What's the advantage of your syntax over the R syntax? This syntax is a subset of R. Okay. Uh, it's our own parser. Okay, it's our own compiler. At um, compile time and at runtime, we, we don't pull in Can any R stuff. No, we cannot. It, that's why we call it an R like syntax. That was our goal, exactly. So the onboarding of it should be s very straightforward. Yes. Yes? Yeah, you can it, and, and in fact, we you no. Know, in our in our test suites, we take our snippets here, okay, and to do some uh, result and uh, you know correctness verifications, we just run the same snippets through the R interpreter. Hopefully, it's that's the right thing, and if, as long as the results match, we are happy. <laughs> so yes. Folks, I just want to ask one other question. We collected more than the sound from the questions, so either in a verbal, I'll ask you to repeat the repeat question, the question. Okay. or we'll have a mic for the audience, and we'll need to serialize the questions. Whichever works best. <laughs> Too many options. <laughs> okay, I'll take it over. <laughs> OK, uh, I, I need to respond to, to this one comment uh, uh, that was, you can just write your uh, R code and, and put it into system and all. That is not entirely true, because um, R is such uh, a beast okay, that's been around for 30 years with uh, 5,000 packages mm -hmm. that we cannot run. Okay? But if it's like R base, okay, and you know, in terms of I.O., there are some differences here. The majority of it should work, but it's typically not the case. Minor modifications are necessary. Sorry. Yes, sir. So if I understand, the, the subset of R, which is supported in ML's language, would all work in an R environment? Correct. Okay. Subset. Except for minor uh, read-write uh, operations. OK. okay. Uh, and some other extensions that we put in, but I can point those out as we go through the language guide. Yes? Any relator you pop out? With Sparkr, I, I will get to that. I'll keep it in mind. Yes? And I think that there's a different IBM system R, which isn't R, right? <laughs> <laughs> system R goes back to VJ. I think it's the 70s. Uh, 40 years ago, which was uh, the first uh, relational database system, right? And which is very different from the R statistical package. <laughs> very good. 
But actually, the analogy is very appropriate, and I actually should have brought up System R because System R, it's a relational database system, and it's like afterwards they started a SQL effort on it, okay, which was a big, big uh, push in the relational database industry, and it's been around for 40 years and created a multi, multi, multi billion dollar market, okay. My higher level goal here is for System ML in this language to become the SQL for machine learning, okay, because uh, we see a, a big gap there. Any other questions? We're only on slide two or three. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now let's put it to work. Um, you implemented this uh, uh, Gaussian non-negative matrix factorization that scales to tens of billions of tweets and, you know, and, and your vocabulary goes up to like 100,000 columns or so. Okay, now you want to run it. Okay, so this slide here should look familiar to some of you. Uh, who does it look familiar to? Thank you very much. At least two. Wow, three. All right, so similar slides are shown in, in for, from Spark community, right, to show really like the true benefits of Spark uh, providing a, a unified programming environment in the program model, which is wonderful, okay, and that's why we decided to go with Spark as well. Because it has, you know, like you, you can suck in your tweets from Decahose, okay? You can use Spark SQL to do some data exploration on it, okay? And then eventually you do the featureization of the tweets, you know, putting into tokens and creating this document word matrix of it, okay? And then uh, you get ready to, to, to call uh, SystemML, okay? And I will take you through those details uh, very shortly on how to call from Scala, that's a Scala program here. Uh, system ML and eventually invokes this gnmf.dml uh, script here, okay? So here, with the Spark SQL, you prepare a, a data frame, okay? And then you take this data frame and uh, register it as an input into your uh, uh, DML script, okay? And you also register the output, which are the W and the H variables. And once you ran it, okay, you can go and, and get the data frames back, W and H, uh, after the execution and do whatever you need to do with it. Okay, so that's really like an end-to-end -end flow uh, with system ML in it. All right. Okay. Now, what is really system ML? So, you've, you've seen this one example, gnmf.dml. Uh, so, system ML it allows you to implement machine learning algorithms and then expressed in this uh, declarative high-level language with an R-like syntax that we talked about at length already, <laughs> okay? Um, actually, just to give you a, maybe a little bit more flavor um, of the language here, okay? So here's our language guide. Um, for the next three hours, we're gonna do a tutorial on the language guide. <laughs> so get ready for it. Oh, the heads goes up. <laughs> All right. So don't worry. Uh, I just want to show off a couple of things. Well, we have data types. In there. It's, it's very limited, so there's room for growth there. But we have scalar data types, and we have um, uh, a matrix data type. Okay, and then we have value types, integer, uh, uh, double, boolean, and string. Okay, you have obviously expressions. So there's a lot of linear algebra expressions uh, in the language in there. Then we have statements, okay, and we have control structures in there, like the typical loops, as well as uh, a, a new loop construct that we call a powerful loop that allows you to do parallel model building, as well as other, you know, each iteration, assuming that there are no loop carriage dependencies from one iteration to the next iteration, it makes it embarrassingly parallelizable, which is really wonderful, and the primary use case for parallel model building for, you know, large correlation analysis and so forth. Yes, sir? Uh, so the array primitive, Dimensions, like or two dimensional. Two dimensional. Yes. So we don't have any. <coughs> repeat the question. Please. Yes. So the question was whether we have only two dimensional arrays, and the, yes. the answer is yes right now. But you know, eventually, I think we even might have a chair to have like a tensor kind of thing in there. Okay. So for deep learning and things like that, those things will become important. All right. Uh, we have functions here, we have uh, variable scoping in there, we have command line parameters in there. So from the command line you can just pass in, similar to like 
C and C++ and V arcs and so forth. You can pass in parameters and, and so forth. And then we have a whole bunch of built-in functions there to construct matrices, to, to do uh, uh, matrix indexing, you know, left in, uh, right indexing, left indexing, range indexing, column, <coughs> row, whatever slicing and dicing you need to do. OK. Uh, does your language support classes? Nope. So no, so we don't have. Closer to a functional paradigm? Yes. Did I hear you say that you have a Python-like syntax as well? Yes. So this one here is uh, uh, our R-like syntax, OK? But the same language concept, uh, we have a, a, a Python flavor of that syntax as well that we call PyDML. And that one is always on the website. Yes, sir? Why did you make two ways of doing the same thing? So one comment I heard earlier from, from our programmer, like the GNMF example that I saw, you know, that should be a no-brainer for an R programmer to write. Okay? For Python developer, and Python is very popular from you know, kind of advanced analytics as well, it's kind of a pain. Okay? So, I get you. Yeah. Okay. Um, you also have uh, you know, APIs, so that, that's our language definition. That's just another example there. And then we have defined APIs, and APIs are uh, to you know, take those DML scripts, as you've seen in the end-to-end -end example, and just invoke them from Scala and from Python and from Java uh, and from R. Um, kind of uh, the whole algorithm and parsing variables, parsing data frames if necessary, and, and, and get the results back. Okay. And that is, we feel, is extremely important for deployments, right? Because you can develop your algorithm and then uh, you can use it in building solutions, in building tools, or whatever people need to do. Okay. The core of System ML then is the compiler. Okay. And I will take you through some details of uh, the capabilities of the compiler, but the gist of it is really a cost based optimizer. Okay. Cost-based optimizer, that means, uh, <coughs> so if you have matrix multiplication in here, like the percent star percent, and depending on whether x is a small matrix or a large matrix, or whether it's a tall matrix or a skinny matrix, or it's a short and wide, or whether it's dense or sparse, you will do a different implementation of matrix multiplication. Okay? And the cost-based optimizer understands the characteristics, understands the cluster the data characteristics, the cluster characteristics, um, and chooses the right runtime operator to get the job done. Yes, sir? And you compile to what? We compile to our own internal operators. Okay, we do not generate code. In what language? Uh, our runtime is implemented in Java. Yes? So you basically compile it to a DAG? Okay, it or goes through s two layers of DAGs, and okay. I will show you what those are. Okay. okay. An optimizer is uh, working at runtime. It works. Um, so we call it a compiler, but it's something in between uh, a compiler and an interpreter. Okay. So I like to call it a compiler because interpreter would assume that you do like what R does, line by line compilation. We don't like that, okay? Because the more code you give us to look at, the better of an optimization we can do. All right. Such as dead code elimination, rewriting. Uh, you know, there's a whole bunch of things that you. Can are able to perform, and I will show you a couple of examples. OK, so we compile it down to our physical operators. OK, and I can show you a couple of those as well. And then our goal was really you know, performance as well as scale out. So we want to run on a single JVM as well as to you know, a 1,000 node uh, Spark cluster. OK, so that's a very high level. Uh, picture of the architecture in SystemML. So we have our DML scripts. Okay, You've seen a couple of examples already. It goes through the entire language layer to take care of, of that part there. Then we have our, opti uh, our compiler with the optimizer in it, where we have all the DAGs and you know, the optimizations, uh, the rewrites, as well as the code generation. And here we have our runtime. The picture is unfortunately a little misleading. OK, so let me explain what we mean. So we started off um, um, doing uh, system ML on MapReduce. OK, that's what we use as, so we generate 
Uh, our runtime was hosted in map reduced jobs in the mappers and the reducers, okay? But we also had always like a, a single node implementation because each one of the scripts, it has like scalar operations. There's no need to go to map reduce or to Spark. Just do it in a single JVM. So we always com compile down to what we call hybrid execution plans. Small operations, single JVM, which is typically the driver program anyways that you always have around. And the large operation, you just farm out to the cluster. Yes? Yes, heavily. So oh, the question was whether we take advantage of vectorized operations. Uh, yes and no. Okay, we have uh, prototypes to um, to use uh, a GPU as a backend, but we have not put that one in open source yet. Uh, but it's on our list to really polish it and, and put it there because there is definitely benefits there in terms of uh, performance. Mm -hmm. But even, sorry, I misunderstood your question at first. People, when they first write the DML programs, they, they use our language as if they implement Java code, which is a really bad thing to do. Though you can, <laughs> you can multiply two vectors, okay, and write it up nicely in a for loop. Okay, don't do that. Just use our high-level operators. If you write a for loop, you will get the performance of a for loop, okay? Just to be clear. <laughs> and the same rules apply for R. So if you open any R textbook, first page, vectorize your operations, okay? Okay, so you have that one, and uh, uh, so that's our hybrid execution plan, and then later on we, we uh, rebased our runtime operators uh, to run against the Spark Core API. Okay, yes? Yes, so uh, that's a very good point. We, ha we had some... Th uh, the question is, uh, is our compiler able to identify badly written uh, DML code? That's what you mean, I assume, right? So we have some thoughts about it, uh, and there's a lot of badly written code around. Uh, so we have things like dead code elimination, like, you know, you. Do a calculation, but you never use it for anything. Okay, so then then we just do this a dead code elimination. We do things like that. We also think in terms of like code motion, meaning you have some uh, code that you only need to do once, but you for whatever for whatever reason it ends up in a while loop. <laughs> <laughs> so we would like to move it out. <laughs> so things like that are possible. Yes. So, so in other words, you've designed it for data scientists. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot bash my customers because system ML is meant for data scientists. Data scientists are great. Okay. So <laughs> Okay. Uh, if you go to the GitHub, don't forget the stop button. Uh, <laughs> but you will also see a list of algorithms there so that we put out, okay? And we try to show off the breadth of our language, okay? Uh, so we have a uh, DML script there for descriptive statistics, very extensively univariate and bivariate statistics. We do classification, so we have uh, multinomial logistic regression, multi-classes, we have naive phase, we have decision trees and random forests, we have k-means clustering, we covered regression, linear regression with several versions of it. We have quite extensive uh, implementation of GLMs with many, many different uh, distribution functions and link functions. Stepwise regression we have in there, we have uh, two versions of PCA that is not shown here. We have matrix factorization, uh, GNMF, obviously, we didn't put it on the slides, but I think you know how to write it now. <laughs> uh, as well as ALS we have in there, and we have uh, two survival models there. Those are all for model building. Uh, in addition to that, we have the matching uh, scoring scripts as well. Okay, so you produce a model and then you shift it over to scoring. For some of the models, we even created PMML representations of the models, okay, but not all of them. And uh, we also added uh, transformation capabilities in a very limited way for you know, data scientists where they need to do uh, like recoding of values. It's known as factors in, in R. Uh, we have uh, dummy coding that you can easily specify, binning, scaling, as, uh, as well as missing value imputation. Can you do splines? Splines? Splines. We have a spline implementation, yes. Uh, 
Uh, I think it's the latter. <laughs> I think it's the latter. The question was whether we got approved from the PMML consortium. Yeah, there's some sort of a consortium behind it, isn't it? I believe so, but I'm not a PMML expert, so um, I, I think we just took publicly available specs and, and, and serialized it that way. And uh, there was one Java library that we used in order to serialize it out, but I forget the name of that library now. It's an open source library. Uh, neural networks we do not have yet. Um, you are probably able to express it in DML, but it's, uh, it's a little bare bone probably that way. And it may not give you the performance that you would expect until we have like a, a GPU backend. Yes? Do you have a grid search framework for this? Nope. Is it fairly easy to express one in it? Uh, You have a grid search like framework that you can run. So we, we have for uh, hyperparameter tuning. We we did some simple examples there, but uh, it's not very extensive. Okay. So it's pretty much you know you're in charge of enumerating it, <laughs> and <laughs> you put it in uh, in a par for loop or in a for loop, and then you iterate over it. But no specific support. Okay. okay. <laughs> All right. So there was a count of like five data scientists. From now on, everyone is a data scientist, OK? <laughs> everyone gets a homework. Uh, you have to sit down and write a DML script, OK? Uh, it's for linear regression, so it's manageable. <laughs> so you have uh, like your data set x, and you have your label y, OK? And you need to come up with a model uh, w, OK? Um, you have this optimization uh, uh, formulation there, and let's say you decide on, on a conjugate gradient algorithm. Okay, so I just want to take you through one example, just to 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 demonstrate that so GNMF or linear regression script they, they don't fall out of the sky magically. Okay, so there's really some magic behind it. <laughs> okay, so here's an example uh, on how this uh, linear regression conjugate gradient could look like. Okay. So uh, you do a really cool initialization of your coefficients here. Uh, you have a really bad model. It's all zero. Okay. <laughs> uh, afterwards, okay, it's a little laggy. Um, you uh, you come up with an initial direction of okay, where you want to go to. And you compute that direction doing a transpose of x matrix multiply with uh, y. Okay, and then you do the negative of the negative. That's your initial direction. Okay, then you uh, compute your um, uh, convergence criteria. Okay, by using a, a, a norm, for instance, and then it's an iterative algorithm. You iterate it over until you reach a maximum number of iterations, or your convergence criterion holds, okay? In each iteration, you compute a step size here, okay? Using a matrix vector and matrix matrix multiplications, okay? Then you, uh, you update, you, you use the step size, okay? And performs a step, which means you, you update W, okay? After that, um, you compute your next direction, okay, and you do that, uh, you know, until you're done, okay. So that's a very simple linear regression conjugate gradient method, okay. After the while loop, you have your your betas, your w, okay, and then you can do some uh, some you know uh, accuracy measures that you compute, like residuals and, and those kind of things, or whatever you please to do, and, and and you're done, okay. So that's your linear regression algorithm, okay. Now you want to Deploy it. You want to use it. Okay, you're very happy with the implementation. System MO, uh, it gives you different ways of invoking it. Okay, you can just uh, uh, invoke it as a Java application by pointing at uh, at your DML script, and you provide some uh, input parameters for it. So you point at your all our data comes out of uh, HDFS. Okay, you point at your X matrix, you point at your Y matrix, and 
and the betas or the coefficients you want to write into the result, which we call b. Okay? So system memory, that is just a, a little shell script here under the covers. It just invokes Java. Okay? Or the same script, okay, if you have a scale out, if you have a cluster readily there to go, you can use our Spark VML shell script, which under the covers just invokes Spark Submit. Okay? And the same parameters here you just feed into Spark Submit, and then it runs it on the cluster. Okay? Or if you want to run it on MapReduce, okay, then you can just uh, invoke SystemML as a char file in Hadoop. And again, it's the same list of parameters. Okay? So those are essentially the different methods. Um, IBM also, in our big data product, we have uh, an, an R package there called Big R <coughs> okay, that you can run in your true R instance. Okay? And that one can connect to uh, a um, Hadoop cluster. Okay, and you can just invoke those scripts as well. Um, but you know, similar things should be possible in the future through Spark R as well. Okay. In terms of APIs, uh, with the ML context, you have seen previous examples there. You can just invoke it through Scala, okay, that you can just run from a Spark shell, if you're a fan of that, or from PySpark, okay, or just uh, from a Java ap application if you if you feel like doing that. No, <laughs> exactly. It, it all goes to the same compiler, to the same optimization, and then it should just exactly invoke the same plan. Yes. Okay. Uh, here's another example. If you want to invoke it from uh, from the Scala shell, um, here's your DML script. You just use our ML context uh, that allows you to plug you know, the system ML compiler in, into Scala here. You register your inputs, you X and Y, and you register your output. You can specify the command line parameters here, and then you just invoke execute. And uh, at the end, you get your data frame back, and you can use whatever Scala tools are available to look at it. I notice you have no function declaration. Does this language not allow for this? This one is Scala. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I meant in the we other language. We do have functions. Oh, you do have functions. Yes. Okay, uh, if you want to wrap your DML algorithm into an, an ML pipeline, for some of the algorithms, one of them being logistic regression, and we are in the process of adding more, you can also invoke it through the ML pipeline. So here you would kind of uh, uh, input your uh, wrapper class for the logistic regression uh, DML script, and then you can define a, a Spark ML pipeline here by setting those three stages, a tokenizer, a hashing, as well as a logistic regression, which you instantiate here, and then you can just invoke pipeline.fit, and uh, you can execute the pipeline. So that should not be any news to many of you. It's just to show off how nicely SystemML fits into this uh, entire Spark ecosystem. OK. You guys want to look a little bit behind the curtain? What's really happening in system ML? Yeah. <laughs> Is everyone excited or kind of getting tired? No more questions or what? <laughs> I think everyone is impressed. <laughs> okay, so we talked about the APIs quite extensively. So there's command lines, there's um, the ML context, there's a pipeline. We always have JMLC. Think of JMLC as um, using our compiler and you embed it as a library in, in whatever you're building. Okay, so we have a defined a Java API, and think of it. Does everyone know uh, JDBC? Okay, JMLC is a machine learning equivalent to JDBC. Okay, so you can take your script. Okay, you can actually compile it, which means you you prepare it. Okay, and then you again similar to the ML context, you bind the variables to it as input and output, and then you can just execute it many many times without over and over recompiling it. Okay, that's what JMLC is. And that is extremely important. It's less important for scoring because that is heavy lifting anyways, but it's extremely important for, uh, it's less important for, for training, but more important for scoring, sorry. Okay, that picture you have seen, so we have uh, more or less, so we have a, a parse in there and then we have two kinds of DAGs, okay? So, so we have, uh, hop stacks, a high level representation of all the operations that we have in a DML script. And we have a small number, less than 10 
kinds of hops. Okay, we have like unary operators. We have, of course, the input and output, like a read and write kind of thingies. Then unary operators. We have uh, cell-wise binary operators. That's a hop. Then we have like for binary <coughs> aggregate, which is typically matrix multiplication. That's a kind of hop. We have uh, some hops that um, don't touch the data but change the, the layout of it. So transpose is one kind of this hop or, or reshape. That's another one of them. Okay. Those are independent of whatever backend you choose, okay? Once you decide on the backend, meaning you tell us, oh, run it on MapReduce, or run it on Java only, or run it on, 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 on Spark, okay? Then we choose low-level operators, okay? And those are geared towards the backend you want to run against, okay? Our runtime is structured in the following way. So typically, you have uh, your control program, okay? The output of the LOPs of uh, compilation is, is a sequence of instructions that you want to execute. Okay, so those get loaded into the control program. Okay, and then you just happily execute those instructions. Some of those instructions are single node instructions, other instructions are what we call control program instructions, those are single node, or Spark instructions or MapReduce instructions. Okay? The Spark instructions just go against the Spark core API, while the MapReduce instructions they kind of get executed in the map and reduce of map reduce jobs, okay? Um, the really cool thing about our runtime architecture is this uh, matrix block library. So if you have very large matrices, okay, that you cannot hold in a single JVM, obviously, uh, we have a block structured binary representation of those. And we have different kinds of blocks. Uh, we have dense blocks sparse blocks, even ultra sparse blocks, because if you have very large data and which is very sparse, you know, most of the cells are just zero, you know, you want to not spend a lot of memory on those guys. Okay? So our matrix block library actually is kind of a hybrid. So for the distributed one we have like one K by one K kind of uh, matrix blocks. Okay. But the same matrix blocks can actually be deployed in, in a single node where you have more memory, right? So but the operation is the same. Then we just redefine our block size into whatever is necessary to hold in a single node JVM. We also have in our control program a buffer pool where you hold small data uh, with an eviction policy against a local file system or just pulling the data from HDFS. Okay, I'm going to skip that one here. Uh, let's take you through an example on you know what those DAGs really look like. Okay. Uh, so very quickly, sa same slide as we've seen before, just with a little bit more detail that I wanted to fill in. So if tonight everyone goes and downloads GitHub, okay, and goes through the source code repository, you will be able to find your way around. Okay, that's my goal. <laughs> so let's take this one expression here. You have a x matrix multiply with a, a, that's a vector plus a scalar, okay, and then a cellwise multiplication with y. We do not do line by line computation just to be clear, but for illustration purposes, I just take this one line, okay? So we have a parser, obviously, and we, we build something like an AST, okay? So we have some representation for it, and then you know, we break down the entire ML program into what we call uh, statement blocks. Those are mostly defined by either function invocations or control structures or things, or a couple of other operations that we had to do it, okay? And then we do live variable, anal uh, variable analysis, so which variables go into the block and which one come out of it. So you can do some clearing out of the buffer pool and things like that, which are very important if you build a, a compiler. Okay? Uh, part of this language component is also what we call a validate, which does a, a semantic analysis. Uh, so here, we, if the metadata is available, then we are able to check uh, the dimensions to make sure that you know, if we do a matrix multiplication of x with uh, b plus sb, we need to make sure that the dimensions are compatible. Otherwise, you know, you just get garbage as results if your dimensions don't line up. Once all of that is, you know, uh, accomplished, then we generate a DAG. Okay, so the DAG, if you if you look at it bottom up, you you, you read um, your b, okay, and you read your your sb, okay. And you have the dimensions for it. So that one is a 500 by one vector. That one is just a scalar value. Okay, then you do a binary plus on it. The so binary plus feeds into this matrix, multiply with x. The result of it feeds into this binary multiplication and you produce a Q, okay? The really cool thing here is those are our operators and we exactly 
uh, understand, number one, the semantics, obviously, but also the implementation of it, which means we can annotate those operators with memory estimates. Okay? We know in order to perform this operation, we need that much memory. In order to do this large matrix multiplication, you would need that much memory, which accounts for the input Okay, or multiple inputs, as well as the intermediate memory that you would need in order to implement the operator, as well as for the output. Once you annotate all those <coughs> nodes with the memory estimates, then you can actually do some operator selection, which says, well, that one is a smallish operation. I can just execute that one in CP. Well, that one does not fit into my, my uh, driver program. Okay, so that one I'm going to let do uh, by Spark. Okay? So with that simple heuristic, and there's many more happening in there, but I just try to keep it simple here. We are able to generate a low level, a low level DAG, okay, with, uh, with the operators in it. And they're very similar except for the decisions that we make in there. Like for instance, this map mode here, we're gonna do on Spark, okay? Once we have this lob DAG, okay, then we just generate an instruction program for it and, and get it executed in the control program. Yes? Um, we also have free writes in there, okay, which make it more complicated. I'm meaning the structure of the computation. Is that the uh, semantically, they so need to be equivalent. <laughs> yes. Well, I'm mean, considering you can do things in different orders. It's a row-wise operation. Um, certain, certain mathematical, um, you know, you you add things or you mm -hmm. you multiply them. The order doesn't matter because it's you're just associative. Uh, so I've actually on the next slide, I have a couple of those examples. And those um, operations we would only execute on the hop stack, OK? Uh, so in that sense, hop and log are isomorphic, more or less, OK? But we do rewrites at that level. We don't do them here, OK? So I think we talked about most of those building blocks except for rewrites, OK? And we have two kinds of rewrites, static rewrites and dynamic rewrites. And I don't want to bore you too much here and just show you a couple of examples here, like static rewrites. Some of them are really very simple, but and that's by far not a complete list. Okay, simple things like, you know, somebody writes down x plus x. Okay. X plus x would tell you, okay, I need to do a binary addition of one input and the other input. Okay. But our opt our compiler obviously can do a little bit smarter like that, okay, and realize, especially in a map reduce or in a spark setting, you would really say, I have to read x here, and then I have to read x again, okay. So there's no need to do that, okay. So we just rewrite that one to a two times x. So just simple examples, okay, or x times x, okay, similar. So you can just convert that to a power of it, but you can also have some more, much more, or like. People write down transpose of transpose of x. You know, obviously, that x don't do anything. Okay, so those rewrites are very easy to add to our system, and um, you know, we have some of them in there. You know, go and add more. Other examples are a little bit more involved, like the simplified DAG operation. So um, here you have a, a matrix multiplication of x and y. Okay, and afterwards you want to take the trace. Okay, but you can rewrite that one, and you can vary it into this binary operation and the asymptotic behavior. You know, Matrix multiplication is an extremely expensive operation, and being able to rewrite it into binary operations is a huge, huge uh, performance benefit that you will get. Okay. Other examples, so those are static rewrites. Why static? Because uh, we perform those um, when we have the dimension information available at compile time. Now, that is not always the case. We also have what we call the dynamic rewrites. And if you have an example like that one here, so you have a matrix Y, okay, and you do matrix indexing on X, a range of rows A through B and C through B, okay. If at execution time you realize that the dimensions of X and the dimensions of Y are the same, okay, get rid of this very expensive uh, matrix indexing operation and just execute X equals Y, which is a no op, right? And there's many, many additional rewrites, so. Um, maybe maybe one more that we should take a look at. I don't know, any favorites? They're all really cool. But may maybe that one here. If you, you know, take the first column uh, from Y, okay, and assign it to X, 
But if you realize that y only has one column in there, okay, <laughs> just to execute y. So simple things like, but you know, as you write down a large algorithm, yeah, you there's a lot going on in your head. You might not realize those obvious things. So why not have to compile those, those things for you automatically? Right. So. Well, so Danny, just one question on that. So uh -huh. you, you're sort of you have to be compiling a runtime a little bit. Yes. Right. You can't do this static. I actually skipped over that entirely. So we have this thing in here called recompile. Okay. okay. Recompile means. Uh, our compiler really shines if we have the statistics, meaning we, we know the number of rows, the degree of sparsity, and the number of columns. Now, for, not for all operations you have that information available. For instance, if you do a contingency table, okay, it, it is data dependent, so you don't know what comes out of the contingency table. You don't know the number of rows and number of columns. If you don't know, you have to make a worst case assumption and generate a very conservative plan that will not run out of memory. Okay which is often bad because very most of the cases contingency tables are small <laughs> unless people do crazy things. Now what we do is we compute a contingency table after that we, we put kind of like a like a, a break there okay and and kick off uh, a dynamic recompile of the rest of the plan okay with the exact statistics and typically you get a much better plan. So that's what we mean by dynamic recompile. Okay? So um, Spark is great, okay, when we rebased from MapReduce to Spark, um, there were a whole bunch of things that really benefited SystemML, okay? One of them being um, like this, um, you know, you, you have the RDDs and you, you can cache those RDDs in, in memory, okay? Uh, but that does not always happen automatically, so um, because they always have this notion called a lazy evaluation and that you know, is good and, and bad and I will talk to that uh, very shortly. But for instance, after the read and if you just read in a, a CSV file, right? So there's a lot of reblocking, maybe recoding or whatever happening in there, okay? You, you only want to do that once, okay? So after all the, all the reads, very often we just do a checkpoint in there, okay? In order to make sure that you do the parsing and the value creation only once, okay? And it's also extremely important um, to do that uh, uh, in front of the, the loops here, for instance, right? Because x is a read-only variable, which is always used in, in the body of the loop. So you don't want to trigger over and over the computation of x again, OK? So we, before the while loops, we create a checkpoint there, OK, to make sure that uh, the RDD for x is cached in memory. OK, that's one of the things. Also, um, um, Spark is really great by uh, allowing us to do this uh, repartitioning there. What that means is we can actually, you know, if it have um, uh, a matrix and, and a vector, okay, you can actually uh, co-align them and to make sure that, you know, you don't have to do a lot of shuffling there, okay, so we can actually uh, uh, inject what we call it a, a repartitioning of Y to make sure that the partition of Y and X line up, in which case you can do like a lot of map side only operations as opposed to going through a shuffle. So that's very important as well. Okay, operator selection. So we have a very simple heuristic in there. Uh, we look at the driver memory. Whatever you give us is great. If it fits in there, we perform it there. Otherwise, we execute it on on the Spark cluster source operations, um, which sometimes may cause problems there. So we also have this thing called the transitive Spark exec type, which means the following that. Um, if I have like the sum of x times y, okay, x times y because x is extremely large, you do it on Spark, okay, but the result of it is small, okay. So the sum of uh, operation you could actually do in CP, okay. In which case you would actually have to take the, the result of x times y, load it into CP, and then execute the sum operation. But it's actually much more efficient to just push the sum, although you could do it in C, just push it onto the Spark and piggyback it with the existing operations in there. So that's what we mean by transitive. Physical operators, we have you know, seven different ways to do matrix multiplication, and the, the operator selection here takes care of which one, depending on the data characteristics, should be chosen. We also have a whole bunch of fused physical operators there. So those typically we put in um, into the system to get much better performance, and that kind of comes through experience. So we look at the large number of DML scripts, and if we 
kind of identify common patterns in them, and then we go off and implement those fused operators. Fused operators means like weighted square loss or, or some other operations. It means that you want to exploit the sparsity, okay? And number one, you want to avoid intermediate results, okay? So a bunch of operations, uh, such as like matrix chain optimization, that's another example here in there, right? You want to avoid those intermediates. That's what we mean by fused operators, okay? Maybe very quickly, uh, our PAR4 optimizer. Uh, so we have essentially three modes to execute a PAR4, okay? If, uh, if it all fits into CP, then we just do uh, a multi-threaded execution. If it's uh, too large, okay, but uh, for the CP, but you want to have, let's say, a higher degree of parallelism, then you want to maybe execute it on the cluster. Okay, what that would mean, we would compile a local powerful and then stand up our CP code in each one of the mappers or executors and do the execution there. If the code or the data doesn't fit into those executors because of memory restrictions, then we have to resort to a third kind of plan, which we call a local powerful with, uh, with jobs, okay, which is a multi-threaded execution, but it still executes uh, Spark jobs. Okay. And there's a whole bunch more details. Maybe I'm just going to skip over those. Um, one important thing here, which is really important, if you want to um, run uh, DML programs on small data, just to create a Spark context, it may take up to 20 seconds. Okay, uh, but <laughs> executing this entire program might only take, you know, 500 milliseconds. So you have to spend 20 seconds in order to do 20 minutes, which just doesn't make sense. So our compiler, if possible, it tries to detect whether there are any uh, Spark instructions in the program and all. If not, then we don't even create a Spark context and just do a single node execution. Okay. How much more time do I have, Alexi? <laughs> uh, anytime. Anytime. <laughs> all right. All the time. Two, mo two more hours? Sure. <laughs> 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 okay. <laughs> I'm the only one standing in the corner, man. <laughs> okay. So maybe I'm going to skip uh, uh, that example here because it's a little involved. Uh, the takeaway, uh, just in two or three sentences, is the following. You have one DML script. It's your favorite uh, conjugate gradient linear regression example. But it just executed on different data characteristics, OK? Uh, you execute it on, on 8 gigabytes with 10 columns, or 80 gigabytes, which has 100, or 1,000, or 10,000 columns. The so same program, you compile against different data characteristics create different execution plans, okay, and we get the best performance for each one of those data characteristics out of it, okay? Okay, and here's the proof. <laughs> so that takes about two minutes, okay, and then we are almost done, all right? So this is the same data characteristics, uh, 8 gigabytes, 80, 808 terabytes, and that is a log scale here, okay? So why is that important? The blue line is what we call, uh, you know, control program and Spark execution. Okay, the point that I'm trying to convey here is the blue line, which is always the best line. That's a system ML performance. Okay, <laughs> running against uh, Spark. Okay, uh, but and then we also measured it against uh, running exactly the same setup against the control program, and then as opposed to Spark jobs, we create map reduce jobs. Okay, that's a, the, the, the green or yellow, I'm colorblind. Uh, and the, the red one, the middle one, that's a spark. So forget about the CP, okay? All the operations are always executed in distributed mode, which is spark, okay? So if you have a small data set, eight gigabytes, and you have driver memory of 20 gigabytes, uh, there's one in important point to make here. Okay, now I'm through the whole thing. Uh, it's very important to avoid distributed operations, if possible, okay? So pushing everything into Spark is not a good idea. Doing single node execution benefits, and the performance of CP Spark and CP MR is really the same because it is exactly the same runtime. No jobs are created at all. So there's a, a 3.6 uh, 3, 3 uh, performance difference here, which is quite significant, okay? Now, if we go to the next data set, 80 gigabytes, this is where Spark really shines, okay? Because that's uh, probably the sweet spot of it. So 
This one here is system ML running some operations in control program and some of them in, in Spark. But uh, compared to, uh, if you compare those two numbers, right, that one is using RDD caching, that one is not using RDD caching because that's only MapReduce. Hence, you have a big performance difference here. Okay? Uh, but yet, you get this performance difference here because the CP operations, there's still smallest operations in the ML program which you don't want to go against Spark. So, so CP and Spark gives you the best performance. Okay? Now, if you go to 800 gigabytes, 800 gigabytes is larger than the distributed aggregated memory. So Spark does a really nice job trying to hold the RDDs and spilling it if necessary. Okay? But the performance gap between Spark and MapReduce uh, shrinks. Okay? And if you go to like 8 terabytes, which is a data set too large for your cluster anyways, so everything is fully utilized, okay? it doesn't really matter. <laughs> It's the same plan that you execute everywhere. All right? Can you comment on the, the difference between CP plus Spark and CP plus MR <coughs> for 8 gigabytes? Yes, that one is the same, and that is just a, you know, a different run with some variation in it. It's the same runtime that it gets executed. Does it mean uh, that uh, actually uh, the work was done inside one CPU in both of those? In one JVM that is multi-threaded. Like Multiple cores, though. So, uh, there are 16 cores. Ah, okay. Okay. Uh, I'm not sure whether I answered your question. That number 21 and 24, think of it to be the same. Okay. And uh, you said that you first implemented on MapReduce uh, runtime and, ah. and then you implemented Rebased it to Spark, yes. So does it make sense to continue to maintain uh, MapReduce runtime? For now, we do. Uh, it's there. <laughs> uh, going forward, who knows? I wonder whether like, a, f a more fair comparison would be to run the, the Spark implementation in local mode, like instead of, instead of <coughs> running it. Like That's a good point, yes. Mode. Yes. Um, I would guess that there's still some overhead there, but it's probably minor. Yes. That's a good point. Uh, yes. So what's the difference or benefit running in Spark only mode compared to CP plus Spark? Uh, question. The point, uh, the, the question was, what is the difference between running in Spark only as opposed to CP plus Spark? Like, because if it's always worse performance? Yeah, it's, it's, it's just to, to get the point across that uh, the CP implementation is important. Yeah, okay. That's, that's all. So in reality, you might not in reality, you always want to run in that configuration. Okay. Yes? Does uh, your system switch between uh, different number types, so 64-bit, 32-bit, et cetera? Or is it, is it all the same? All the same, yeah. Okay. We don't switch. I'm wondering if that contributed to performance. Yes. OK. Uh, OK. Uh, the point here is cost-based optimization is important. Okay, I hope that is. Hybrid execution plans are important, so don't do everything in Spark, but uh, CP is important as well. Um, Spark is great if the data fits into distributed aggregate memory, but then you know as you grow, uh, you know Spark does not fall flat on its ground, but it actually gracefully you know, kind of degrades and it does not get worse than MapReduce, okay, which is a really good thing. <coughs> yes, that was a question. Yeah, no, because I always thought, you know, Spark's in-memory architecture means it will always be faster. But with MapReduce, I assume depending on your program, it can run in several phases, right? MapReduce, MapReduce. Yeah. Yes, you know, uh, multiple jobs you might have to right. run, exactly, which, which is bad, right? Which so. Is bad. That's why you get uh, that lousy performance here compared to there. I see. Or here, yeah. Because, you know, you run a map reduce shop, dump it out. You, you come around in a loop, oh, I need to re read it back in. Do a little operation, okay, I'm done with the loop, write it back out, iterate. So having the in-memory RDDs for iterative algorithms is a must. Yes? How do you represent the matrices? Do you use blast? 
Okay, that's three questions. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, question number one was how do we represent the matrices? So we have a, a block structure, the representation of the matrices. Uh, the way we uh, represent them in, in Spark is we have Java paired RDDs of a, a matrix block ID and as well as a binary block, which is our own representation. Okay. Compress? Pardon? Do you compress data? Uh, we have some work on the way for compression as well, yes. And do you have special comments for sparse matrices? Yes. Okay. And even if you have a large matrix, some blocks can be sparse and other, uh, other blocks can be dense because typically it's not uniformly distributed. Yes? Yeah, now, do you sample the data in order to characterize it, or how do you decide? Good question. Uh, so maybe that got lost a little bit. So we, we need a little metadata, OK? And number of rows and number of columns is a minimum, right? Because that allows you to validate as well, right? Otherwise, you do garbage matrix multiplications that don't line up. So that's a minimum, right? And if you give us the sparsity as well, that is great. So coming from relational databases, they have many more statistics, yes. The data skew is what kills you. Yes. It's the John Smith that you search for that all of a sudden performance drops. Yes, but that is a different application, right? Sure. Because now you get into indexing, and that's like yeah. a point access. Uh, ML, it's mostly scans. You look at all of it. And I think there was a third part, so it's a BLAST library. No, we have our own matrix implementation. But eventually, especially for deep learning kind of things and hardware acceleration, we, we would resort to like CUDA or QDNN or whatever is out there. So on CPUs, you don't do vectors? We have our own implementation that is cache conscious. But not like, like in the sense that you draw like we try to like We try to write the Java code in a way that it exploits you know, the cache lines, uh -huh. okay, it's very conscious about it. But there are also operations which at the same time operate on multiple data. SIMD. SIMD operate, yeah. yeah. We exploit those. Okay. Yes. Uh, I forgot, we, we did some performance measurements against Intel MKL, which is like the, the number one on Intel at least, <laughs> uh, and we are very close to it. Okay, so they definitely are better because they're a native implementation and we are Java, that's number one. So it's a sys. But uh, we, are, we are pretty good. So is it some kind of intrinsic or how does it work? You cannot be just curious how do you sync from data to it, it, So the chit kicks in and, and eventually it, it, it goes and, and creates a SIMD instructions. Ah, so it's a JIT job. Yes. Yes? What? Okay, so. Oh, oh sorry. E either one. Okay. Um, so, adding on to that question, actually, so what kind of so what kind of Java code are you writing, and how are you verifying that it's actually using the SIMD instructions? Are you just timing it? Timing. Or are you looking at the summary, right? No, we did the timing. Yeah. Right, okay. Yeah. So, sort of related, but a, a little bit is how do you how do you profile the code on this to determine how much time is being spent in each operation, or do you have some guidelines for? profiling this to get the optimum performance out of it? Um, so we have a, um, so for, for individual Java code, we do a lot of like Java kind of profiling. That's number one. But the more important question is actually, and we do have a problem there for, for profiling because you know, although Spark is great, it's a lazy relation kind of, so we cr create our instructions, right? And you know, we want to execute those instructions and um, the lazy evaluation, sometimes you does just don't know whether under the covers it still redoes some operation. That is kind of very troubling for us <laughs> to do proper profiling for it, and uh, we wished we had better tools for that. So uh, one more question on these numbers. If you know, Basically what, what that says is at the far end of the data table there, there's no difference. Right, the yeah. first order, right? Yeah. So it's eight terabytes right. on, on a dinky cluster. Right. So could I do that same amount of work with half the nodes in that time? No, it's fully utilized. It, right, fully utilized how? CPU, memory, IOPS? Uh, how, did you, how did you know that you couldn't cut back on the resources allocated in each of those configurations? Uh, you know, what, was the you fuse, what was the fuse in the system? Like if you, you have to plot it by each one of those. So, yeah, right. so eight terabytes. So typically, um, like to just saturate the network card. I mean, 
No, I think no, I think in this case it it was the CPUs because okay. it, it does a matrix multiplication, and that one okay. uh, is a CPU intensive All case. Right, so you right. couldn't have done you, you in order to hit those run times, you needed that many cores of 100. Yes. Okay. Yes. I got it. It's probably fair to say that it parallelizes near near perfect, and that each thread is only serial. Every operation is only serial. Yes. Inside. Yeah, that yeah. should be. I, I'm not, I'm not sure whether we really verified it. But that's what I'm guessing. Well, I mean, you're you're doing multiple DAGs. It's yes. what you're going for, I'd imagine. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay. <laughs> There's some uh, lessons learned there. You know, Spark switching from MapReduce to Spark, it, it was a good move for us. Okay. Uh, stateful distributed caching is extremely important for iterative machine learning algorithms. Uh, in terms of memory efficiency, going from MapReduce to Spark, you have to be much more careful to not screw up things, okay? because having the data in cache is great, but it takes away from other memory. Um, lazy RDD evaluation is, uh, is your friend and your enemy. Okay? <laughs> uh, it is your friend. From, for us, it was our friend because we came from MapReduce. And what we had to do there, we had to do, at the lowest level, a lot of piggybacking to piggyback a lot of our instructions onto a small number of MapReduce jobs, OK? That thing went away, that entire component for the Spark implementation, because Spark does it for us. So in that sense, it's, it's really a friend. But for profiling and kind of things, you have to be much more careful. Because you, know, you want to clean up some variables to free up stuff. But if there's still some, <laughs> some pending operation on it, then you do the wrong things, and things die. OK? And you know, for declarative ML, the, so system ML is really about declarative machine learning. It was a, a, a really good proof point because uh, we had our 20 plus machine learning algorithms implemented, okay? And none of those scripts had to change, okay? All we had to do was switch out the backend, and for our users, nothing changed. They got happier because it ran faster, but no code had to be changed for them. Yes? Have you thought about just writing a distributed blast in LaPak? Scala Park? Yeah, like sc Scala Park? Yeah. No. <laughs> uh, because, um, so we looked at Scala Park and things like that, uh, but they have their own restrictions. Okay, they typically perform very well, okay, but uh, they're very particular in terms of data layout uh, as well as data placement. Um, you could probably do that, and you know there is a whole bunch of libraries within IBM who actually do that for for Power, for instance. So we have like an ESSL library that goes in that direction. We did not use it because um, typically those things th they don't differentiate between dense and sparse. Right. Okay, they only do it for for dense, which is limited. But there are sparse there are sparse implementations like two sparse, for example, and Kuda. Uh, for GPUs, yeah, yeah. Right. For GPUs, but I, I thought you were talking about clusters. Well, clusters as well, but you could just implement the same spec. Yes. Have, yes. They're fairly well defined algorithms, I guess, is what I'm getting yes. at. Yes. Yes. So having a block. Right. So, so, so for CUDA, for instance, for dense, uh, you know, it, it, it's pretty good. Okay. But you know, what, what do you do on the CPU? That's only for a GPU. Okay. Right. So what I'm saying is, is these are well defined APIs. APIs. So you guys did with PMML. Why couldn't you do the same thing with the block spec as well? Sure. So you yeah. Just implement a block. Yes, yes. I mean, if somebody, you know, we could actually, you know, take our matrix block library, okay, and define those APIs, okay, and and if people want to use it separately, you know, it should be possible. Yeah. Um, it has a lot of. Request? Pardon? You would accept a pull request? Yes, we do. Right. Yes, we are open for business, and if you go. <laughs> Maybe it's a good point uh, to kind of reiterate this uh, set of challenges for the open source community you had. Yes. Uh, where folks will help uh, this enough? You can read the summary slide. That let's skip it. So just to go over that. So uh, you know you can find on the Spark. You know after you push the 
the start button, you can go to the Jira server and actually look at our roadmap there. So the roadmap includes a whole bunch of things in terms of consumability. So right now our APIs, they are very coarse in the sense of you can invoke DML scripts, okay? But there's no fine-grained language integration. Like, like Link, you know, that's always a very nice example there. Or creating some other DSLs, um, like Mahout DSL, like the Mahout uh, Scholar, Sp uh, Scholar DSL or, or others, that might be useful. I'm, you know, if people want to go that route, you know, it doesn't have to be Scholar. It could actually be Python as well. Python might actually be a better choice than Scholar if data scientists prefer Python over Scholar. That's one aspect. There's a whole bunch of work to do in terms of items for for the compiler and the optimizer. You know, additional data types. Um, improved cost models, our cost model for, for the Spark backend, it's kind of limited right now, it needs more improvement there. Um, fused operators are, are always great, they give you really fantastic performance. Um, data scientists are here, so you go and implement your favorite machine learning algorithms in DML and contri contribute them back. We, we have a couple of them in the works, so k and N, we are in the process to add, and there's others that we want to add. If you have your own favorite algorithm, implement it in DML and put it out there. Okay? Time series is, is something that people should look at. So that actually, I was wondering, uh, so what, how is, does this compare to Mahout? Uh -huh. uh, and pretend I'm somebody who has not used either of these extensively. Yes. So. Like, are there cases where you would favor one over the other, or is this always your favorite? So I'm, I'm a strong believer in declarative machine learning because it really does this optimization under the covers for you. Okay, it runs on, on an iris data set, I keep repeating myself, up to 10 billion rows. For Mahout, they, they don't have an optimizer in there. Okay, and that will always, you know, that is one of the major contributions to the system at all. Uh, we see that there is more between Spark and streaming uh, applications. Um, the question is whether that could work against streaming applications. Yeah, so like big data streaming, like continuous uh, streaming. Right, so for, for training, I mean, that's kind of a little no, like odd. For, for, like for IoT scoring. IoT application, for yes. Example, uh, yes, but for, for, for training, typically you have uh, you know, multiple iterations over, over training set, right? So it's kind of a confined thing. But for scoring, I, I, you know, definitely it should work, right? So, so as your IoT events you know, kind of flow in, okay, you, know, you quickly want to score it to say, you know, this one is a hop or a top, you know, if you have like a classifier. That w for th those kind of applications, our JMLC with very low latency, with very low overhead, you, know, you compile the DML script only once and reuse it for many, many scorings, so that should be work. Okay, any other questions? <laughs>